So Christine Peterson, uh, Fawcett's co-founder over there, Mark Miller, who's uh, an ex-Google, uh, now uh, our senior fellow in computation and uh, has uh, a startup Agoric um, on kind of like decentralized um, kind of like blockchain applications. And, and I, uh, we're currently writing a book together on intelligent voluntary cooperation as a strategy to strengthen civilization. And this is a mouthful, but the idea is that, you know, I think if we, the, the long-term future of civilization is, is really important, right? Once because of next generations, but also really because we want to be around for it. And so it's a really important kind of question to ask ourselves, what would it mean to get that right? Right, it's also a really hard question. There really isn't very much agreement on it, but can we actually dial it down to like a few principles that are kind of deep pessimizing, that should be uncontroversial um, for us to execute as a civilization to set us up uh, on track. And so this is a book that we've been starting and kind of like we, we started with, with this analogy, like if we think of civilization as this ongoing game, right? Just by virtue of the fact that we're living, we're all in this game already, right? We're interacting with institutions, we're interacting with culture, um, we're in interacting with social institutions that have been constructed by generations before us, we're iterating within that game and we're setting up kind of the, the kind of like checkerboard for um, kind of like the framework that civilization um, will be embarking in, uh, in the next round. And I think if we think of like our contribution to this ongoing game of civilization, I think this is on the one hand really inspiring because we're not walking down this blind alleyway, but instead, you know, we're contributing to this ongoing project. And this is great because next generations will be able to go places we couldn't go. They will be able to, um, to know things we couldn't know. And just because we set the stage. But I think thinking of it as this ongoing game also um, kind of like draws out the responsibility that we actually have because it is not really like we can go opt out of this game, right? Um, we really have to play. There's no way to opt out. If we don't do anything in action, we'll just, <laughs> just automatically leave future generations and our future descendant with a very, very different game uh, to play. So the idea is we should really kind of like, um, kind of like figure out what are kind of uncontroversial ways and how we can uh, strengthen civilization. And um, there's a lot of value differences, right? Value differs wildly across, uh, across, across humans. I won't ask you that question of like, which way you would switch, but I assure you that even if we're all quite goal aligned in this room, many of you would have different answers to this problem. And this is not even the problem that we're facing as civilization, right? There's a lot of different trellies hurling down a lot of different tracks. Um, it's really hard uh, to kind of like align as a civilization. Uh, maybe we can do some first principle philosophizing that hasn't been going all too well over the last, let's say, a few thousand years, right? We haven't reached more conclusions really and we're going a little bit about that more into detail in the book. And also it seems, even if we could with philosophy, who cares, right? Because, you know, um, it seems like m more people in civilization really are kind of up for this multi-track drifting right now rather than serious ethical reasoning, right? So there's a lot of value differences right now in civilization. And uh, that's not even all, because even if we could all agree across humans what would be a good um, game to pass on right now, it's unsure whether we should pull that lever because values changed a lot over time, right? Our values are very different to the values of witch burning um, um, peasants in, in, the, in medieval times, right? And those values are very different still from the values of our fish ancestors, right? And we are clearly quite happy that our fish ancestors didn't lock in their values um, if they had a chance to. So it's unclear whether we should do it now, right? There's potentially a much larger space out there. So we want to leave kind of like open futures if possible. Um, and then there's a third type of value difference uh, that's, excuse the sci-fi slide, right? Whether you think of this as aliens or really just as other sentient uh, creatures that exist right now, different evolutionary contexts will give you different value sets. Um, and we're not doing a very good job at taking those into account right now. It's unlikely that we'll do so in the future. And this is not actually a sci-fi problem because we are already in the process of creating those um, beings right now. We are in the process of creating other intelligences and we'd like to think that they look something like this, right? That they're our magical uh, brain children and will carry along our values. And we have some uh, influence over that by trying to align them. But ultimately, their evolutionary context looks a little different than ours, right? So I think, um, you know, given the fact that the computational speed is different, given the fact that there's different sensors attached, it's, um, 
it's the question is kind of how much alignment uh, can we expect, right? So in a nutshell, values differ a lot across humans, a lot across time, they differ a lot across entities. Um, and, you know, we're still kind of like stuck with this problem of like, what are good ways to set up civilization? And how bad is it actually that values differ, right? Because usually we think of value differences as value diversity as a really positive thing, right? We want value diversity. It's a feature. It's not a bug. So maybe instead of trying to uh, send civilization down this one track and all align, what we should be doing instead is to set up a framework in which different values can flourish um, and can mutually benefit each other, right? And that's what we're trying to set out in this book. Uh, and that's the principle of intelligent voluntary cooperation. <clears throat> uh, and in a nutshell, really, and so it's kind of composed of two principles. It's, on the one hand, we need to prevent involuntary interactions to allow the peaceful pursuit of goals, right? The minimum we can make sure, given that we have so much value diversity, is that we can all peacefully pursue the goals that we have and the values that we have, and we can peacefully coexist while doing so. But, you know, that would be still a pretty sad life if we were all building our utopia in the basement. Um, Instead, there's also a lot of things that we actually agree on, right? So we need to tease out where are those intersection points where actually our values overlap sufficiently that we can cooperate on, right? We don't all in this room have to agree on what the right path is, but we have to find those ways in which we can beneficially cooperate with each other. So that's the principle in a nutshell, really. And if you think, well, this is all still airy-fairy philosophy, actually there's a few action recommendations um, that derive from that. For example, for preventing involuntary uh, in interactions, um, the, the biggest threat that we will be facing is automated violence. I think uh, Jeff Laddish will tell you a little bit more about that tomorrow in his talk, but you know, whether it's from drones or from slaughter bots, like Future of Life published a really great video on that, um, or from, you know, uh, from cars, uh, from autonomous cars that have bad cybersecurity, or from biotechnology and nanotechnology, the future threats will be auto auto autonomous. They will be automated and really any technology um, um, can pose a significant risk to our safety if it's automated. So we really uh, are focusing on preventing violence, especially automated violence. Um, and this is not only a new problem. There is a precedent of how to do this, right? We have done this once with nukes before, and we have survived since World War II. So maybe we can take it as a precedent. And we have survived uh, mainly out of luck, really, <laughs> but uh, also because we had non-proliferation treaties in place, backed by monitoring regimes. So our, we are proposing in this book to do the same now for automated threats. Those treaties have to look different. Um, we're proposing multipolar active shields. So those are kind of like active shields that are backed by encrypted monitoring regimes. And uh, the idea is that, you know, um, first we need really good computer security because those threats are out in the wild. But the monitoring that's required to monitor for automated violence, especially small scale, has to be very different than the monitoring that's required for nukes, right? You can see, I mean, it's a very different, this is the type of monitoring that you can do for a nuclear power plant, and then over there you see molecules, and it's just a very different scale. And that's really scary, right? We don't want at all to have like, um, kind of like a top-down surveillance state, right? We need really good encryption. We need privacy-preserving encryption. And we need to have a multipolar access uh, where uh, all watchers can watch each other if we want um, kind of like a monitoring fabric uh, that cannot be corrupted um, for a totalitarian surveillance state. So we're discussing this in the book, but that's just really one way to prevent involuntary interactions. But we said we came for more. We want to cooperate better, right? Currently, cooperation is very limited. We're limited to our cooperation like we can richly cooperate with each other in this weekend because we trust each other. We will we'll likely have iterated uh, interactions with each other. But if we want to cooperate with most people in the world, uh, we need contracts, right? And contracts are hard to do. They're expensive to do. They're hard to enforce. Um, and so they're really wildly limiting our way in which we can richly cooperate with each other. Um, luckily, there was a really good precedent, right? The World Wide Web came along. Everyone could set up a little website and um, could suddenly you have like really cooperate with everyone in the world. The problem was that those types of interactions are really quite limited, right? We can give out information for free, we can, um, and we, and we can, we can give out products, we can, we can pur purchase products there, but it still it lacks this rich context of um, cooperation that we have amongst ourselves, right? Luckily, um, crypto commerce came along um, or is coming along. And yes, I know, um, I think we're all still kind of stuck in the crypto winter thinking, but 
I know this is really, I think, up to us on how what we make of it. I think smart contracts really ultimately have the chance to automate a lot of the kind of like of the current legal contracts that are really hard to set up. And by doing so, they massively, massively really decrease the risks and the costs of cooperation. And this is not only that we can cooperate a little bit better on our uh, like petty issues on a day-to-day -day basis, but they also enable large-scale cooperation um, just by virtue of the fact, for example, um, we, we go through like 10 different examples in the book, and by all means, feel free to join the session tomorrow if you're interested in that, but one of them is, you know, like large-scale, um, the ability to credibly commit um, for large-scale actors to avoid something like arms race dynamics, or the ability to use assurance contracts for civil society to cooperate on kind of like Kickstarter projects. So this assurance contract is basically, I stake that I will donate this and this much, or I stake I will do this behavior change if enough other people stake the same thing, that it would actually make an impact, right? So this is a really cool Kickstarter way, and you can actually have an automated way of enforcing this. So we can just actually get a lot more of the things done that we're currently struggling to coordinate on. So anyways, we'll be going through 10 of those different ways in which we can better cooperate uh, using tools from crypto commerce. So if you hate crypto or if you love crypto, please join that session tomorrow. I want, I want your feedback. So in a nutshell, this is voluntary cooperation across humans, multipolar active shields to prevent involuntary interactions, crypto commerce to increase cooperation. And then we want to intelligize the whole thing. I won't go into detail here now, but as we get better and better about doing this with humans, we want to uh, include other intelligences into this cooperative framework. Um, we don't only want to, we need to. If we want to solve the problems that we face as a civilization, we need all intelligences that we can really get <laughs> to the table. So we want to richly cooperate with them. We need good computer security, right? The, the analog to kind of like uh, uh, preventing involuntary interactions across humans. Given the fact that intelligences are um, instantiated on the digital area, we need we need really good computer security as the first shot. But we also want to uh, cooperate richly with them. The fact that they have a different evolutionary starting conditions means, in principle, there's something that we can um, bring to the table where we have some uh, positive um, kind of like value diversity with which we can cooperate. So rather than trying to like create one super intelligence uh, that, and then trying to goal align it with us. Uh, we actually want a lot of instantiation of intelligences um, in a decentralized fashion. We want goal diversity to richly cooperate with them. And then there's always the question of, um, you know, uh, of job automation and of the fact that, well, if we have other intelligences, won't they just get much better at cooperating with each other than we do? And won't they just out compete, uh, out cooperate uh, uh, us? And for that, we're proposing a universal basic capital, which is basically based on a one-time distribution of space resources. And so the idea is that in an economy in which we can rely on other intelligences, we will have really massive returns to capital. And we'll get much, much, much more productive. The way that we can have human beings be effective agents in this world is by equipping them with capital. The way to do this, um, you know, which may be better than redistribution, is by distributing things that are not distributed yet. And there's currently, um, you know, a number of, of undistributed space resources. And I think even though this sounds sci-fi, I think actually we have to get around to do something about this because the window of opportunity is closing, given that many actors are currently gearing up to go into space. So this is one way, I think, of strengthening human cooperation uh, in this area. And, you know, I think just you know, to wrap it up, really, you may say, well, this is very nice and tidy, but how stable is the system? You know, are we just trying to instill this alien uh, principle um, into civilization? Actually, um, we have reason to believe that this is a viable strategy um, because it is not a totally new idea, voluntary cooperation, right? In fact, it is the secret sauce of civilization. It is what has civilization brought many of the things that we really, really value about it already. You can see the decline of violence, right, um, which was correlated highly with an increase in GDP per capita, happiness, and health. So the reason I, I think, like, just to give a quick speculative history of civilization, right, less violence meant more voluntary interactions. This m meant more of the interactions where people could opt in or out, which meant people opted in if they actually expected to benefit from an interaction. And this is wildly correlated, I think, with a lot of things that we care about. We get better and better at cooperating, right? We get more and more empathetic to each other because empathy is really just about me being able to offer you uh, better things that you may want um, by pursuing my goals. And so I think it's a really positive feedback loop 
we should strengthen the system. Um, and we should really consciously think about that this is a principle that has been working and how can we adapt it to A, avoid future threats of violence and B, to uh, seek future opportunities to cooperate better that are enabled by new technologies. So that's the book in a nutshell. 